So, I want to talk to you about our future, about our presumably digital future. Close your eyes. Have images come to your mind. Think 10, 20, 30, maybe even 40 years from now. What will our world look like? Will we have flying cars, automated traffic? Maybe you've seen the film Minority Report, cars racing down, not to be controlled by humans. Will we have robot doctors, like in Star Trek, who operate you perfectly? Or will we have robots who look just like us humans and are our friends, our partners, our lovers, our family even, like in Spielberg's film, AI? The images we have about our future are very much not only influenced, but shaped, impregnated by images around us, images in popular culture, particularly films. So it makes sense to have a close look at these images. And if you do, you'll see that there are two strands, two type of visions. Let's call the first one, the euphoric one, and the second one, the apocalyptic one. Let's start with the euphoric one. This one is very much propagated by Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley, as you know, is a valley in the United States where many wonderful inventions come from. But despite the fact that it's a valley, it nevertheless stands up high upon a hill and the eyes of all people are upon it. What I just did was a slightly modified quote by the Puritan preacher John Winthrop, who in 1530 came to the New World and gave a famous pep talk to his fellow Puritans by trying to give them hope endurance, strength to face the upcoming hardships. And he did so by telling them that they were an elect people with a special mission and that they had an example to set. And this train of thought has stayed within US American culture up to today. The idea of a mission, you have the mission to conquer the West in the 19th century, you have the mission to conquer space in the 20th century, and you have the mission now to conquer digital space. The idea of a mission is... Um, seems to that in the last 200 years, whenever new technologies come up, millineristic hopes kind of come with it, are delivered with it. You had this when electricity came up, chemistry and the automobile. If you look at what Henry Ford said about the new automobile, he actually called it the new messiah that would bring about prosperity, peace among all people. And that would bring paradise on earth. So what is this digital paradise like? I would say three things are important. The idea of interconnectedness, of transparency and non-ambiguity, it's either O or one, yes or no. So, the mission, what is this digital mission about? Let's look at images, images from Silicon Valley. What do we see? The sky, the clouds, heavens, really. That's probably God, second cloud from the right, somewhere. 
you have the idea of teleology. You start with an ape, you finish man with an iPhone. It's the top of the evolution. And again, the mission, the key words, transformation, revolution. So this is really more than just a new technology that would bring you money. This is about bringing paradise to Earth. So I spoke of paradise, and as you know, when there's paradise, there is hell lurking not too far from it. So what is digital hell like? Let's look at movies. Let's look at a movie like Blade Runner, particularly the first one, which is much better than the second one. <laughs> you, maybe you've seen it, the images, the vision of the world that's full of advertisement. It's all about buying and selling. It's a kind of an economistic hell. Or think of a movie, not a very good movie, but it's good for a purpose. Tron, the legacy, where you have a very recurrent theme, the theme of dictatorship and fascism made possible through the means of digitalization. And a movie we've probably all seen, The Matrix, the epitome of human helplessness. Bodies lying around in a liquid, the machines have taken over, humans no longer possess dignity, privacy, and self-determination. This is digital hell. So, heaven and hell, the two visions, seem to have not much in common, but in fact, they do. And that is passivity. In both cases, on the one hand, there's nothing you can do about the future because you're going to be saved anyway. And on the other hand, there's nothing you can do because you're going to be doomed anyway. So it's passivity that runs through the discourse of digitalization. And I want to make my point even more drastic and speak of regressive fantasies that are linked to the discourse of digitalization. And you probably want proofs, and I'll give you proofs. Regressive fantasy number one. <laughs> My son loves this movie. Wally. -E. These are not babies, they're grown ups. So it's the idea of the land of milk and honey robots who cook for us, who clean for us, who operate us, who work for us, who do everything for us. What's left for us to do? we fall back into a kind of childish bliss. Regressive fantasy number two. Robocop, or here, Iron Man. The transhumanist fantasies, the merging of man and machine, fit well together with a pre oedipal fantasy of powerfulness, of invulnerability, immortality even. And the last thing, which I call modern animism, she looks quite in love. She probably believes that her new boyfriend really cares for her. Well, this is an animistic projection. Freud was very clear about that. He said, if we project feelings and a soul onto mechanical puppets, we fall back into a magic thinking. It's a fallback into pre-scientific and pre-religious thinking. So, despite the fact that the discourse on digitization always comes across as super high-tech and rational and cool. What it's really about, if you look at the images, if you see what's being said, what's being implied, well, it's regressive fantasies. 
and unrealistic hopes. And the bad news is, I'm afraid I have to bring you bad news, they're just that. And the really bad news are, well, we are not perfect, we are pretty mortal, and we're humans. And digitalization is not going to change that. It's still us humans, and we want to lead a decent, a humane life. And the conditions to lead a humane, a decent life haven't changed in the last centuries and are not likely to change. What is it about? It's about being able to live with dignity, with self-determination, and the right to privacy and to ambiguity and to secrets even. So the questions we need to ask ourselves in the digital age are not when will we be saved or when will we be doomed, but what are the technologies we can use to enforce and strengthen the conditions to lead a decent, humane life. And so the challenge for you, for me, in fact, for all humans through all times, is to be adult. And in order to be adult in the digital age, we need to start by being adult about the digital age. Thank you. Thank you.